Hi guys, good evening. How are you keeping today? It's another beautiful day, a fantastic evening. I trust your day has been good. I really, really hope that you've had a good day. Well, I have. I have. I've had a really productive day and I'm delighted that it's slowly winding down and I can come here and still share my evening with you guys. Thank you so much, Pat. Glad to see you join us today. Um, I'm delighted you made it home in one piece. Very good. And you got home just in time to connect with us on the show. Delighted to have you join us today. How is everyone keeping? I hope you're keeping well and you're keeping safe. Yes, if you're in Ireland, we're just into phase two of the easing of Ireland back into normalcy. Whatever our new normal will be, we don't know yet, uh, but gradually we're going to start stepping into it. And that kicked off. And uh, I hope you're playing your role and you're playing your part in still keeping safe. Look, this thing is not over yet. And you know what they say, it's not over till it's over. So we still have huge roles to play in ensuring that we keep ourselves safe and we keep the people around us safe. So please keep washing your hands. Don't take it for granted. You go out, you get back in, you wash your hands, right? We all have soap, so we can do that easily. And to ensure that you are also, if you have the uh, ability to get a face mask, please cover your face. Well, not your entire face, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Wear a face mask to keep your, protect others and also uh, to ensure that you're protected when others around you wear a face mask. Hi, um, uh, Ivalyn, it's great to see you join us here today. I trust you're keeping well and safe as well. So everyone who's connected, thank you so much. Delighted to have you with us this evening. It's a beautiful Tuesday evening. And as you know, it's our experience Tuesday. So today, my guest is a fine man, right? And um, well, he's already smiling there in the background. Uh, you, you'll see what I mean when he joins in. So have your questions ready. Today, today we're going to be sharing an experience from um, a man who has seen the world, who understands what it is to take a piece of story and make it into a gigantic global bestseller in the cinemas and get people to come see what that story is trying to tell, perhaps to make an impact or to entertain. Well, stories are really for entertainment once they get in the cinema, but some even to make a change within communities. So I am delighted to welcome my guest today, who will be sharing of his very wide experience. Please join me to welcome the one, the only Terry mm -hmm. McMahon. Hi, Terry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm good, thank you. You're keeping well? I'm good. Is that my phone or your phone is going? I on? believe that's your phone. <laughs> perfect timing. This is perfect timing, and that's just technology at its best, isn't it? That's perfect. Very good. We'll get rid of them for now. Harry is an award winning director. Um, he's, uh, he's winner, Directors Guild of America, Finder Series Award, Grand Jury Prize, Woodstock mm -hmm. Film Festival, the Irish Time Film Festival of the Year, um, Audience Award, Cock Film Festival, and the Grand Prix at, at Moscow, Breaking Down Barriers. You're a writer, you, you directed, um, St. Patrick's Day and Charlie Casanova. I mean, so many movies you've directed and so many awards you've won. Don't think you can disappear on me. There, I got you back right in there. <laughs> Terry, what award in the movie industry haven't you won? I mean, like you've got so many feathers to your cap, so many accolades, and you, you're you just a global phenomenon, Terry, and you've, you've toured Africa, and you were in Nigeria as well on a project trying to to, to work on a movie, you've toured several parts of the world. Terry, tell us about you, the part that is not reaching in the papers, and it's not reaching the, in this, all these accolades about the awards and all that bit. Tell us who Terry McMahon is. Who are you? <laughs> I'm certainly nothing of what you've described. Oh. Thanks for that. I'd like to meet that guy you just described. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've made a couple of movies and I won a few awards. That's not being false and modest, that's the reality. But uh, in terms of what might be interesting to your listeners, and I know that you do this to inspire people, so 
yes. which in its own right is a beautiful aspiration. I got aspects of my life that are political, aspects of my life that are heartbreaking in terms of the realm we're living in and this new normal you're talking about, but that's not what this is about. So we keep it about the good stuff. Uh, I, I, how do I start? How do you make a movie was the first question. Mm. And I don't have any formal education. I don't have any formal qualifications. I don't, or I didn't. I don't come from a history or a legacy or a background or a family that allows or facilitates that kind of thing because of its history. So I was homeless when I was 16. And when I was homeless, I learned what it feels like to be a ghost in your own life, to be so invisible that if you sit beside somebody in St. Stephen's Green Park, mm. you're afraid that they will sense it off you. Mm. you then if somebody does talk to you, you're afraid that they see something broken in you. So mm. kind of stuff. And then eventually you find some way of expressing yourself. And the most effective way of expressing yourself was, I got a small little pencil from a bookie's office. And uh, I'm not interested in horse racing or laying bets or anything, but I was in the bookie's office to get out of the rain. Mm. The back of a bookie slip, I started to write something. Mm. And from that simple act of desperation, in order to stop feeling invisible, the first sentence that came out written in pencil on the back of a bookie slip was the beginning of a journey that led to writing a screenplay, that led to being brought to Hollywood to work with Daryl Hannah and wow. to different people in different contexts. So it's a it's an original act of desperation very often is the thing that will ignite in you the discovery of what you want to find in your own voice. And that can apply to anything, any discipline. Wow. How, how did you become homeless at 16, Terry? I mean, you were very young. Uh, well, I was actually 15, but I came, I came to Dublin at 16. Um, it's, a, it's such an Irish cliche. Uh, I got a girl pregnant. She was a couple of years older than me, and uh, my mother and father who were quite young themselves. My mother is gone now, but uh, mm. they didn't really know how to deal with it, and uh, I got thrown out. Wow. My girl ended up miscarrying, but I ended up uh, coming to Dublin. I thumbed a lift to Dublin. I, I <clears throat> stayed in derelict buildings for about a year. I tried to continue school, and that didn't work. I had a great bunch of friends, amazing people, but even they had to return to their homes and return to their lives. They were doing the intercert at the time. I don't think the intercert even exists anymore, but it's the exam before the leaving cert. Mm. And then I became so distant from everybody. You become self-conscious, you become embarrassed mm. because you're lonelier than hell. You don't know what loneliness is up until that point and suddenly it's all you know. So I moved to Dublin and then from there, I, in an act of desperation, I saw a advertisement posted on a lamppost for the Dublin New Theatre. Mm. And I knew I loved movies, but that's all I knew. My father introduced me to movies. And I, again, in an act of desperation, every time an act of desperation, there was no planning or forethought or intelligence behind this. I approached, uh, it was up in Gardner Street in Dublin. I uh, went to the audition, terrified. Adrenaline was pummeling through my body. Wow. Like I'd never imagined. And I'd been in violence, I'd been in all those scenarios, but this was a different kind of fear. And I uh, did the audition for Dublin Youth Theatre, and they selected me. And then I was so incapable of engaging with people at that time that I went to one class in Dublin Youth Theatre and ran from the building. And then a guy came after me, Jim Bruton was his name. I'm bizarre, I remember his name, a lovely young man. And he offered me a cup of coffee. But again, I would never have a cup of coffee. We never sit down with a stranger. We never sit down with anybody. Mm. And he told me about a course that was in the Liberties, not the Liberties, um, the other place, in Shakur. There was a course in Shakur, in Shakur VEC school. Yeah, I know that school. Yeah. And they had started a course. I had just signed on the dole, and they had started a course that if you were on the dole, the dole is social welfare for your listeners. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you were on social welfare, they would cover the cost of the course. So I went on audition for that again out of desperation. I was living in a bed sit at this stage. I got my first bed sit, which was 11 pounds a week. I wow. felt like a king. To be able to close my own door was the most incredible feeling. And I went to the audition for uh, Inchicore VEC, 
and the course had already started, but they had they allowed me on it, and I arrived on the first day. They told me to, to come in the afternoon of my first day, but the course had already begun, and I was in abject fear. And I went to the bar, and I ordered two pints of Guinness, drank both of them down, <laughs> and there was two people in the bar who were watching me. One of them was Jimmy Fay, who now runs the National Theatre in Northern Ireland. Jimmy, Jimmy Fay. Jimmy, yeah. Oh, my Lord. Jimmy runs the Lyric Theatre. And yeah. Ken, Ken Harmon, who writes for RT and for the Abbey Theatre. And Jimmy is godfather to one of my kids. Ken is godfather to another of my kids. I'm best man at the wedding, all that kind of stuff. But at the time, we didn't know each other at all. He was Both of them were from Tala. And they, they both, we talked about it many times since. They saw in me a kindred broken spirit. And... Uh, we progressed through the Inchicor, and then I got expelled from Inchicor for reasons I can't even remember. <laughs> but we decided to put on a play. These three w working class guys with no knowledge, no experience, no birthright, and certainly no entitlement. We put on a play. It was Edward Albee's The Zoo Story. Mm. We put it on in the International Bar. And we hired that, I think, for £13 for that week. We pooled our welfare money, and we rehearsed the my in my bedroom and my bed set. And it was the most electrifying experience we'd all collectively ever experienced. And we all think, talk back on it now. Ken got married recently and we had a fantastic night, but we said Jimmy and Ken, every time we meet, we talk about how that was kind of the birth of us. Hmm. So it's a long-winded answer, but that's what brought me eventually to a place where, despite a total lack of confidence and abject fear, we go, it's possible to make something out of nothing that might move other people to change their sense of self in the world. Mm. What I'm hearing, and that's so powerful, what you're sharing there, Terry, what I'm hearing is that we need to learn as humans to channel our, our pain and our fears to a more productive outcome. Uh, it's not something that is easy to do, but sometimes we meet people along the way who enable that, um, that process. And that's what happened to you. You met the people. And you were able to connect with them, and that's that's how your journey began. I want to ask you a question about parenting, and just going back to what you said there about how you were kicked out because you got a girl pregnant, and we still have that happening today. I mean, mm. you mentioned that you'd gotten involved in in gangs and different stuff, and you could have died, you could have been killed. You know, L thankfully that didn't happen. For parents who are still at that space where they feel when a child does something wrong, then it's an embarrassment to them as parents and uh, the child has disappointed them. From your experience, what would you share with parents who are watching right now regarding their children when their children make mistakes? It's a great question. Uh, I, I have five children, as we were talking about earlier, and I, I have five children ranging in age from 25 years of age to six months old which is just insane but, <laughs> I, but but the thing that i remember but when you're that age it's not that you don't know what you feel it's not that you don't know what you think it's that you don't know how to find the words to articulate it in a way that doesn't make you feel like a fool doesn't make you feel vulnerable doesn't make you feel exposed doesn't mean doesn't make you feel open to being exploited or manipulated so you shut down instead of opening up but you're not doing it as an act of vanity, or you're not doing it as an act of defiance. You're doing it because it's all you know. Because when you're alone, wrapped up in a ball, at least you know where you are. You hate being there, but at least it's the place you know most. And when you are homeless, and when you, I remember, it's funny, I remember listening to the radio. Before I left school, I, 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 uh, I won an art competition. I was drawing something, and there was a guy who ran the local newspaper. And the prize was... I think 30 pounds or something, which was a huge amount of money for me. And I bought a small, um, uh, it was a, a, they had a word for it at the time. I can't remember what they called it, but it was a stereo that pl played tapes. There was no CDs at the time. It had cassettes. But, yeah, it had cassettes. It was a cassette player, but it was a big one. It was, and it was detachable speakers. It was kind of preposterous, but. The stereophonic it, thing is. <laughs> some kind of nonsense of that, but it felt amazing to have it. And, and despite the fact that I had nothing, I bought this because I wanted to have something at night. So I was sleeping on top of a, a derelict building. And I remember at the time, it's amazing how much the world changed, but at the time, uh, the radio shut down at midnight. 
So you had to, after that, you had to find these illegal stations. Radio Luxembourg was the big one. It was, it saved the lives of probably generations. Amazing. It introduced people to art and music and thinking that was way beyond the parochial limitations. But I remember the first time hearing, it was Mozart's Piano Concerto number 21 in E minor. I'm not saying that like I know these things. I'm saying it because I wrote it down. I was so stunned by it. Mm. And it was Daniel Barenboim was a player and his finger comes down and he hits that first note. And it's like it spoke to me on a level that I had never encountered in my life. So when I hear words like lonely, I didn't understand them until I went through them. And then lonely is a word that comes from poetry or comes from music. It doesn't come from your soul. But when you experience it in your soul, all you have to do is hear the word for it to resonate on the most profound level. And the same with these kids. When you, when you are a parent, the first thing is the kid doesn't hate you. The kid doesn't understand anything except trying to roll up on a ball because they're terrified of everything. And then when they break out of that ball, they break out of it in the most extreme way. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's imperative that a child is allowed to make their own mistakes. It's imperative that a child is allowed to mess up, sometimes badly. Now, there was extremes as well. You've got to make sure there's a moral code of conduct where their ethics are allowed to be established and f fanned into something that is individual to them. But you get to a point where you go, the more we tell our children what to be, we are very often reflecting our own failures and we are demanding that they become what we fail to become. And that's not fair on any child. And when you impose that moral stricture on a child, you think it makes you feel good and you're doing it in your head for all the right reasons, but it's the wrong reasons because it's not about them. We need to allow our kids to mess up. We need to allow our kids to be vulnerable, but to recognize vulnerability as a strength. So when they are curled up on a ball, they realize that they're not alone. And when they do break out, they break out in a way that's a celebration of their capacity rather than a destruction of everything that is in opposition to them being in a ball. It's imperative that we understand that kids are, despite all the technological advancements, despite everything, kids are still blind, deaf, in the darkness, just trying to find something that makes them feel less alone. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, wow. Powerful words there, Terry. And I feel strongly that it's coming from the heart. You know, it's coming from a place that really wants to shake parents up, to wake up to a reality. And I'm so delighted that you mentioned something there, something I've always hammered on for parents, that it is important for parents to see that the children um, would, would sometimes um, become rebellious, but we have to understand the why they get rebellious. It, it's not in their plan to get rebellious. But there is something behind it, and we need to find that something. And but is, it not, is it not a necessity for them to become rebellious? Mm. Do you want a child who lacks the rebel gene? Do you want a child who lacks the warrior fight? Do you want a child who acquiesces to your failed idea of what they should be because you are not that? Or do you want a child who has the independent courage to forage their own destiny? Hmm. Powerful. And the second thing there, which, which really spoke to me and which I always share as well, is that uh, us as parents, while we're trying to help our children understand that when we ask them to do something, it's for their own good. Most times it's us projecting what we wanted to do. Some people would refer it to our failures. It's us projecting our failures onto our children and hoping that they can deliver that which we're unable to deliver. And they don't want that life. They want their own life. And we need to help them understand that. I watched a documentary once and I saw a guy who was explaining child psychology. And he was talking about how children, just remembering what you said about children calling up there. He was saying that when they call up and they want to open up again, what they want to see is a parent with the arms wild open like that, ready to receive them. And they can call right back into that, those arms. And that's what our, our children are looking for. So powerful but, shed there. <laughs> but also, we, we must remember that we don't know what the hell we're doing. Yes. It's not all on the kids. Kids keep on looking at their parents like they're superheroes. And then there must come a day in a child's life when they look at their mother and father and realize, these two idiots are just as dumb as everyone else out there. <laughs> we're something special. So, you know, we got to be allowed to mess up too. <laughs> <laughs> very true very true i had a guest once who said who made a very profound statement says 
we are at a time where parents need to recognize that we don't have all the answers. Yeah. And sometimes we need to listen to our children. They might have the answer that we're busy looking everywhere for. It's right there in front of us. I agree. Totally. I think, I think I, I couldn't agree more except that one thing. Not only do we not have all the answers, we have none of the answers. But the least we can hope for is that we're asking some of the right questions. If that's who we are, if at least we're asking some of the right questions, we're on the right path. Mm -hmm. If we're adamantly imposing answers, we're arrogant, we're not engaged, we're not listening, and there's no progress for anybody. Ask mm -hmm. the right questions at the very least. Mm -hmm. Terry, tell us, are you married? That's a very... <laughs> <laughs> And your husband in the room there. Oh, well, yes, you leave that to me, Terry. You leave that to me. <laughs> He's a very, very lucky man, and he knows it. I can hear him giggling in the background. <laughs> I'm are not married, no. Married? Right? <laughs> tell me, tell me, are you married? <laughs> I'm not married, no. But I, but I have been taken advantage of a few times by a woman who's, <laughs> who's the mother of my five children. So. Hey. Okay. You told us earlier that your kids are from 25 to six months, did you say? Mm -hmm. 25 years to six months? Yeah. You have a six-month-old and you say this woman takes advantage of you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Are you sure you're not the one taking advantage, Terry? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a poor, innocent boy from the country. She's a big-bodied, beautiful woman from Fingless in Dublin. She takes advantage of me, rest assured. <laughs> I have little say in the whole process. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> We've got people joining into this conversation, Terry, and the messages are just brilliant. Um, I've got uh, Olu, um, Olu Makinsko here who says, this is inspiring. Fab says, Terry, I'm okay with what you're saying, but my problem is my own mom. Terry is a young chap who's joining us from, I believe it's Cameroon. And he says, I really love your spirit, Terry. You are a true father. Oh, wow. And um, Ivelyn says, great way of seeing things. Uh, yes, fantastic. Great comments coming in there. Um, Terry, eventually you gravitated towards production, mm. the movies, the cinemas, haven't come through this journey that could have broken you, but somehow it built you and helped you find your own destiny. How did you, before we come into the industry itself, how did you survive through that process, through those challenging times when you weren't sure who you were, you were very young, you were very um, vulnerable, you were broken, you were lonely, and I dare say that at some stage you probably experienced some form of depression. How did you go through it all and come out on the other side? Uh, I tried to kill myself. Wow. So... It's a, and, and being, being as dumb as I am, I tried a really idiotic method. I was living in a bedsit and there was a shared bathroom in the hallway. And I convinced myself that I could starve myself. Again, how dumb do you have to be? So I used to take long baths and I rigged, at the time I used to put coins into the box for the mm. electricity. Mm. But I rigged it in such a way, I stuck matches in the side and rigged it in such a way where I could keep on getting more and more power. So I stayed in the bath for 11 or 12 hours, kept on refilling the bath. So not only do you become dehydrated, but you become physically weakened. And at that it stage, I thought... Hours. Say again? 11 hours. Yeah. So at no, that stage, I, I figured I would slip under the water and simply pass out because I'm too much of a coward for anything else. If I'm going to die, I want to die peacefully. But what happened was, unfortunately, when I slipped under the water, which at that stage was freezing cold, my body went into shock and it stopped whatever it was that was inviting death. I woke up several hours later, blue, absolutely freezing and absolutely starving. And I got out of the bath and when I got out of the bath, it collapsed. And when I collapsed, I woke up again a couple of hours later and it was about two, four o'clock in the morning at this stage. And I never felt closer to death on any level. Wow. And the, at the time, this was in Rathmines. At the time in Rathmines, it was a 24-hour shop at the top of the road. I can't believe I'm telling you this. I never told anybody this. But anyway, I went to the 24-hour uh, the shop, and I used to steal food because I had no money. 
there was a Swan Centre in Rathmines. I used to go into the Swan Centre, and I read somewhere, perhaps foolishly, that if you are caught stealing and you can prove that you didn't have the money to buy it, but you needed it to eat, you will not be done. So I used to casually walk in. I never stole anything that I didn't need. I never stole anything from people, but I would steal from a store. I'd go in, pick up whatever I needed and very confidently walk out. And I was never caught because surely the security guard looked at the confidence of this person and thought there's no way they could be stealing. Yeah. I went to the 24-hour shop. I took a long roll of ready-made garlic bread, but it's ready-made. It's wrapped in a, it's wrapped in a cer ceram, uh, transparent plastic. Yeah. And inside is the butter and the garlic. But again, being too dumb to realize that it needed to be cooked, I just stuffed it into my face. I was so starving. I was so hungry. And I stuffed it into my face. And if you're starving and if your body goes that weak and your stomach becomes that small, it projectile vomits out, yeah. whatever the hell it was. So when it came back out, I remember going, this is what it feels like to be alive. This is what it feels like to hunger, to feel alive and to feel. And despite the black dog of depression returning whatever amount of time since, there's no desire to engage in that again. But is... Is there a desire to engage in living, a desire to engage in behavior that might be deemed to be extreme, but at least comes from the courage of the desire to live? So I learned how to yearn for life by getting much closer to death than I should have. And that same fear is there, the same horror, the same vulnerability, but the action to defy it is more emboldened every time you take a step toward it. That makes sense. Mm. Mm. Oh, wow. So for people who are watching, it's really allowing themselves to not, not of course, not to experience death, but to allow themselves to take the pain that is about to break them down, to turn that into a reality through which they can see a better life. So the how for you as a person, what would you consider the how of that process to be? Well, it's interesting because it, it, even though the language you're using, which is so beautiful, but the language you're using is a language of hope. Mm. And when, you, when you're feeling hopeless, hope is not a word that makes sense to you. Mm. When you're feeling that removed from the world and somebody tells you that the world can be better, you're going, that's nonsense. That's not true. Now, it's not that you're trying to prove anybody to be a liar, but your whole system, your whole thought process, your whole physiological self is telling you it's a lie. And your whole body is telling you that the most effective way to engage with yourself is to remove yourself from the world. That's, that comes to you as a good idea, not a bad idea. That comes to you as something that makes sense to you. Now, it's not a massive drama. It's not a massive engagement where you're screaming in pain. It's very often a tiny, quiet whisper to yourself. Now, when you're in that place, the world that we know can be remarkable, can be miraculous, can be astounding, doesn't exist. So when we say to somebody, the world can be better, it's not fair on them to expect them to understand. Mm. But what you can say to them is, I know the horror, I know the pain, I know that you fear it will never go away, and there's a possibility it might never go away. Yeah. But there is also the reality that the actions that you take over a consistently applied period of time will shift your worldview to such a degree that you will never forget the horror you were th went through, but you also will remember that it does not have to be just that mm. for the rest of your life. That you can be absolutely as equally profoundly powerful as you are equally profoundly sad. Wow. Now that's the how. And that's the key. Terry, we'll be right back. We're going to take a short break. Guys, don't go anywhere. This is Sharon with Yemi for just joining us. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. My name is Yemi Adinuka, your host on Sharing with Yemi. In this part of the world, there's this segregation that comes with persons living with disability. If human interaction is naturally normal and when you don't have it, your mind can play tricks on you. I've come to realize that my only mode of communication is my photography. If I am a victim of abuse, there was nothing I could have done with that person to avoid being a victim except get away from. 
the first time ever, I think us as grown-ups, we don't have the answers. When I vomited blood, I said to God, into your hands I commit my spirit and I do the hard, hard work of creating the right atmosphere for any woman who has a story to tell to know that I will fight for her right to tell it. So join me at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. If you're just joining us, this is sharing with Yemi. It's our experience Tuesday. Thank you for being here today. My guest today is a dynamic filmmaker, a great man who is making Ireland proud in different parts of the globe, Terry McMahon. And um, Terry has been sharing of his personal experience over time, um, how he's gotten where he is today. When we're not even at that stage yet, but he's been sharing how he went through uh, been homeless at a young age of 16, been thrown out for a mistake he'd made, and how he had to try and live through that mistake, how he found himself as a young man, how he recognized opportunity, meeting the, the men who eventually have become part of his life and who have guided him through uh, to bring him where he is today. So if you're just joining us, this is sharing with Yemi. Today we're looking at how to how to create experience using stories and using the film industry. And my guest today is the amazing Terry McMahon. Terry, welcome back from that break. Great Hi. to have you back. So let's go to you now. I mean, you've told this part of your life that is really very touching. And uh, I mean, if anyone is sitting here today who is feeling hopeless. Just looking at you, uh, I believe hope will be lifted. So today you're one of Ireland's best exports. You, you, you go out there and you make Ireland proud in the in the movie industry. Your name is written in gold. If they had Ireland doesn't have what's that thing they have in Nollywood where they go and they, they go and put their their the fingerprints on it. Hall of Fame. The Walk of Fame, yeah. The Walk of Fame, right? We should have one in Ireland, you know, and you should be there. But you've gotten to the stage, haven't experienced all those challenges, yet you came through it and you are now a guru in the movie industry. So of all things to choose, I know you said you loved the, the cinema and you went for that play. How did you then venture into movie making? Uh, it's, again, it's, it's interesting that... that the idea of going to... Just give me one second. Just close it there, thanks. Sorry, shall, shall I leave? Yeah, I'll be with you soon, okay? Okay, yeah. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, man. Thank you. It's my son there. I know, I love it. That's the reality of social... Of, of being socially... So I've been on social media, live, reality. <laughs> big drama happening at the moment. Right? <laughs> uh, it's... Uh, back to the idea of the reason for doing something, the motivation, the objective. If you're doing something for fame, if you're doing something for for money, if you're doing something for sex, if you're doing something for whatever the things are that we're told are important, mm. there's, there's nothing wrong with that. We might have moral issues with it, but, there's, but it's an understandable aspiration. I think there's a billion easier ways to get all those things, and also a billion easier ways to have your soul be emptied by them. I wanted to make something or do something that that just once, just once in your life, that if you were going to your grave, you thought, okay, one person in a dark room was impacted mm. by what we made. Because it's not I made, it's we. Making a film is a whole bunch of people. Mm. And I, it sounds absurd, but when, when I was homeless and then when I got my first bed set, I used to go to the cinema all the time. There was a, uh, I think it was called the Carlton Cinema, or it was an old cinema down on Abbey Street. Mm. And it used to do reruns of old movies. Not old movies, but, but movies that had been recently been successful. So, obviously, the owners of the cinema were getting these films very cheap. And you could smoke at the time. I don't smoke anymore, but I smoked the cigarettes at the time. Mm. And you'd get your dollar money on a Tuesday, it was. And it was a small amount of money, and you were totally removed from the world. But choose the door money was exciting because you check and see what was on the cinema. Because this cinema used to show double bills. And those double bills would be, I remember seeing Eddie Murphy coming to America and Raw together at the same time. It's like a pivotal moment. But I also remember sitting in those red, velvet, sweaty, 
smoke stinking places and thinking this is my cathedral i don't realize it's a cathedral but it is this is the sacred place mm. and i remember thinking if there was ever a time in your life where you might in the future make something that somebody sitting alone smoking a cigarette who forfeited food for a box of popcorn a cheap ticket a cigarette and to watch two double bills twice that's not a bad way to end your life and i thought I'd love to do that some way in some form in the future. So I tried to write something. And in the process of trying to write something, I discovered that there are people out there who respond to the written word. This respond to the truth of the written word. There are people out there who get angered by it. There are people out there who think you're all kinds of wrong as well. So while you've been very kind in describing me as you're describing me, that bears no relation to my reality. A lot of people in Ireland think I should be put in a box somewhere and buried. But it's a different conversation. But the idea of, of deciding that how can you turn your sense of isolation into a way of communicating with somebody that you'll never meet, but they will be in a dark room somewhere experiencing a sense of location for the first time where they feel less alone in the world. And that to me is always the reason and the function and the purpose for writing. And then the idea of making films was that same idea. And I'm lucky enough that I've, I've, I've only made, I've made three films. But those films, uh, one of them in particular, played all over the world. And we were in dark cinemas. And after the film would scream, there'd be a question and answer session and a plaintive voice would come from the back of the theater. And somebody who was just as lonely as I was then would begin to tell their story. And while you've been very kind that we're talking about all the awards and everything, they meant nothing compared to that singular lonely voice who came out of the darkness to speak of their experience. And that was the drive to make something. So I wrote this script called Charlie Casanova. I had been involved with the film board. Uh, there seems to be this notion that I have an acrimonious relationship with the film board. I don't. I have questions about some of their ideologies. I have questions about some of their choices. But I also think they're brilliant on multiple levels. And one of the levels that were really brilliant on was that they gave a complete outsider, no hoper, first timer, a shot at giving a development funding to a script that I wrote. It was a script, a script that I, a prison script that I wrote. And then I went through that whole development process and got involved with producers and all that kind of stuff. And eventually I thought, this is madness. And I ended up writing for Fair City, the TV show Fair City. Hmm. I wrote a whole bunch of episodes for that. But before that, I auditioned as an actor for Fair City. And one of the things you have to do is, because RT is tax funded, they have to make it open to anybody who makes a phone call. This was at a time when people answered their phones. Mm. So even though I was terrified, I, uh, I had a new, newborn baby, and I knew I had to do something, change something drastically. And I called uh, RTE, and a, a wonderful man, wonderful, wonderful man, uh, who was a producer, he, I left an answer, a message in his answering machine. And that I discovered I was being investigated by the social welfare office. Mm. So I had to pretend I was living somewhere else in order to keep the social welfare at bay, all that kind of nonsense that anybody who's been through this understands it. But I went to do this audition. And when I went to the audition, there were some well-known actors there, some famous actors there, all that kind of stuff. And I felt totally, totally in over my head. But I listened. I sat outside the door and I listened to everyone else doing their auditions. And it was an angry piece where somebody is threatening somebody. And all these actors were doing these angry voices. And I was sitting outside going, I don't, any violence I've ever experienced was quiet and dangerous. There was nobody shouting. There was nobody doing that. There was only cowards and fools who were shouting. And uh, then it was my turn, and I told the other people to go ahead. I let everybody go ahead of me. And then I moved in last. And I, at this stage, I knew the script. I made sure that I knew I'd learned everything. And I walked in, and the crew were exhausted. The producer and director was exhausted. Everybody was exhausted. And the guy who had been reading for the other role at this stage had become very confident, very mm -hmm. cocky. And he was, he, was, he was kind of undermining all the other people because he was in his element. So in the scene, it comes to the part where I'm supposed to threaten him. And he's very arrogant toward me. And the producer is looking at me going, is this the guy who left the weird message? This is just nonsense. And everybody's about to wrap up. And out of nowhere, instead of shouting at him, I just reach across and I put my hand on his leg. And then I start look, just very gently letting my hand trickle up toward his inner thigh. 
and this guy started turning purple and his voice broke and everything shook and I just became more and more gentle more and more loving and it became one of those subversive things where the whole room shifted everything changed wow, wow. And it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a long shot, and I was terrified doing it. And I asked him beforehand, I said, is it okay to touch you? And he says, you touch me anywhere you want, kid. That's how arrogant he was. So, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, they ended up casting me in the role. So I went back to meet the welfare people, and I told them I'd been cast in this role, and this soap opera. I, I never watched an episode in my life. It, soap opera doesn't do it for me. But <laughs> I understand why some people love it. But in that six-week period... Uh, it gave me enough money for our newborn son. It gave me enough, it gave me and my missus enough money to have a bit of a laugh, and I presumed it was over. But for whatever reason, those six weeks when they were transmitted captured the imagination of people in a way that was shocking. Mm. To this day, there are still people who call me with their characters' names, even if I'm in another country. But having done that, and then realized that I need to make some way of, I need to find some way of making money. I started to write episodes for the show. And the uh, script editor at the time, another wonderful man, he gave me a shot at, at writing an episode. And he was so happy with the episode, he commissioned me that Christmas. He says, I'm going to be Father Christmas. I'm going to be Santa Claus, is what he said. And in that, they gave us enough money to be able to have a great Christmas. Then they ended up writing over 100 episodes of that show. We wow. ended up being able to go on beautiful holidays, buy a house, all that kind of madness that we buy into. And uh, then I decided that it was a lovely journey but it meant nothing, and I made a film called Charlie Casanova, and I was so broke, I got sh I got fired from the job. <laughs> I got shafted, I got fired, but got shafted, and uh, I I had written this crazy script. Uh, it's called Charlie Casanova. The tagline is "You don't know him, but he already hates you." Mm. And it's about how capitalism was destroying our culture, and it was about how psychopaths were taking over our culture, and this was at a time when we denied all this was happening. And uh, I put an ad up on Facebook. I said, intend making no budget feature. Charlie Casanova need cast, crew, and equipment, and a lot of balls. This is sincere. Make contact. And I was embarrassed, and I went to delete it, and somebody popped up. And then within 11 days, we were on set shooting this film that would end up changing my life for the absolute worst wow. and the best. And it became a small, tiny little project that went around the world and caused mayhem. It was picked up for distribution by Studio Canal. It was despised by the Irish Times, by the Joe Duffy Show, by all these kind of things. It caused murder. It was fist fights in the cinema. Literally, in Poland, it was a fist fight in the cinema. And uh, from that, I thought I would never make another film again. But I had another screenplay that I wrote at the same time. It was called Patrick's Day. And... Uh, a producer Tim Palmer, a wonderful man, he said, let's make that. We made that, and that changed everything again. So we have no idea what's around the corner. We have no idea what's next, but we do know that if you take courageous action, the consequences are real. Absolutely. So powerful. One action leads to another, and the consequences are real. I've got a question here from you from Aisutia, who says, what would you see as the most difficult part of process of making a film here in Ireland? Remaining loyal to the truth. Mm. Now, now that that sounds trite, but it's not. At the moment, we have a, a, we have a, a specific indoctrination that's happening in relation to the Irish film that's about gender. So we're obsessed with gender. Mm. Now, do I think women should be making films? Absolutely. Do I think more women should be making films? Absolutely. But do I think that those women should be from a certain socioeconomic background, a certain socioeconomic and educational background? where we don't discuss equality in relation to deprivation, we don't discuss equality in relation to class, we don't discuss equality in relation to race. And we have rejected all of those conversations in favor of a, a quasi-fall equality. So that's a separate conversation, but that's, that's one of the most difficult issues to overcome right now. Mm. But the major issue is remaining true to the pursuit of truth. Now that means that, first thing is, if you're making a film and you think it's about your vision, you think it's about your genius, you're an idiot. You're a moron. Mm. It's not about you. It's not about you and having some idea that you had in your mind. It's about walking into... Making a film is going to war against the impossible. Mm. It's not about going to war with each other. It's about finding some way of making the alchemy of a surreal, fictional world feel so real that you will suspend your disbelief in your reality and 
allow yourself to become psychologically and emotionally involved in this new piece of alchemy. Hmm. That's the most difficult thing. And the only way you can do that is by having what they call a thematic question, a thematic interrogation. So, for example, with Patrick's Day, the tagline is, is uh, love is blindness. Love but, is blindness. Love is blindness. Hmm. The next question, do you believe in love? So are you asking me? See, that pause told us everything we need to know. Uh, <laughs> of course I believe in love. Oh, yeah, I believe in love, yeah. But, but, the interviewer becomes the interviewee. <laughs> but, but it's always, you're looking for that moment, that, that reaction. Because in that reaction, in that silence, something incredible is possible. Mm -hmm. So if, we, if you believe that, like the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. Yeah. You believe all you need is love then you have a faith. Um, there's a remarkable man, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Victor Frankl is his name. Mm. And Victor Frankl, it's one of the books I read when I was homeless. It's a small, slim volume, and it, it blew my mind and my heart wide open. But I bought it in a second-hand shop. And Victor Frankl was a survivor of the concentration camps. And he kept on witnessing, as he watched, the people who died versus the people who survived. Mm. Survived, had a meaning and a belief system that transcended their reality. Now, that could be God, it could be whatever you want it to be, but they had a drive in them that transcended the limitations of their reality right then. Mm. And Viktor Frankl says, so live your life as if you have already made the mistake you are about to make, and this is your second chance. Hmm. Live your life as if you've already made the mistake you're about to make, and this is your second chance. Yeah. Mm. So in essence, then, what would you do to correct that mistake? Absolutely. It's, it's the idea of what's remarkable in film is that you're given a second chance. In life, we don't get second chances. But Viktor Frankl was saying that in life, psychologically, you can create for you a second chance. It's where we, we use knowledge in an effective way to such a degree where the knowledge that we have acquired is beneficial to the choices we make now. Mm. Now, I, I, I read the Bible a few times. I was involved. In, so I was... I was fascinated by how writers try to communicate but i had never read anything as simple and as effective as that because you can apply that to any given circumstances in any scenario and the moral imperative to do the right thing that is bigger than your need is what makes you spiritual is what makes you remarkable that same principle needs to apply to film you need to understand that the biggest obstacle is not money is not all the nonsense the biggest obstacle is to find a core truth, the seed of which will survive the whole post-production process mm -hmm. and hit the heart of the person who's sitting in that dark cinema and now they feel less alone mm -hmm. because of the seed that you sowed all the way back then. That's the hardest thing to protect. Wow. So it's really it's really about, uh, I mean, this thing we were having a conversation um, on before we came on the show, it's really about being able to take, it could be an issue, you know, and address it with a view to making a meaningful difference, but through how you tell the story. And are people telling are, are people telling real stories that are making huge enough impacts to change people's lives? Though, uh, I, I th it's very, again we talked we mentioned this earlier, but I have nothing against action films. I have nothing against any of those kind of movies. Entertainment is a great thing, but. If you are making something that's about an idea bigger than you, then you are humbled by the process. Hmm. That humility becomes infectious. That humility is the thing we pick up on. If you are doing something that is driven by ego, it might be flash and impressive and all those things, but we are feeling your narcissism coming off those images. Hmm. And we might even be impressed by it. We might even be inspired by it because of our own element of narcissism but it is vacuous it is like a takeaway meal we regurgitate it or we defecate it and it's utterly meaningless there's no sustenance to it mm. the films that move us on such a personal level that we feel like we are no longer alone in the world for that brief time that comes from a place of courage and that courage has got to be driven by a desire to take the limitations of technology the limitations of budget, the limitations of your own ability, 
and those around you, but also the majesty of those around you, the incredible, undiscovered talent of the people around you. Once you find a way to harness that, or at least you're driven by a desire to harness that, the outcome can only be something beautiful. Even if it's a mess, even if it's a car crash, the residual effect is something beautiful. Mm. By that, then you can't go too far wrong. Mm, so true. And Ivaline asks a question here. She says, can this be applied to writing a book? Can you take the same principle, the same model, and apply to writing a book? Absolutely. Tell her Tell her to think of her... Well, she's watching, is she? Okay, I'm going to tell her myself. So she can hear you. Think of the... Th What's her name again? Uh, Aveline. Aveline. Aveline, think of the thing that you were most embarrassed by. Think of the thing that you perhaps are most terrified by. Think of the thing that you think separates you from everybody else. Think of the thing you want no one else to know about. And start to write about that. Because that's your core truth. And not only will you discover that you are not the only one feeling it, but the people who read it will go, I'm not the only one feeling it. And that same fundamental principle applies across all art forms and all human engagements if we're lucky. Oh, wow. So there you go, Evelyn. You have your first book reason. Start scribbling. Start scribbling. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take a comment here. Um, what would you see as the most difficult part of, uh, of your work, you know, since you've become a, a producer, a director, a scriptwriter, working all this, like we're saying earlier on, I mean, you're jack of all trade and master of all. What would you see as the most difficult part for you when there's a, a blockage, when you're, it feels like you're not progressing? in any of the productions you've had before? What would have been the most difficult part? What would have been the challenge? Everybody's blocked. Everybody. Mm. When we talk about writer's block, everybody's blocked. To be a writer is to be blocked. To sit down in front of an empty page is to be blocked. To think that you are not capable of writing a sentence that makes any sense even to you is what it means to be a writer, is what it means to be blocked. Now, there are blocks outside that. The problem, the difference between writing, when you're writing on a blank page, there is no limitation except the ones that you create for yourself. Yeah, yes. Get out of your own way and do the thing you were born to do and have the courage and the application to find the singular truth in what you're doing. Get out of your own way. Wow. Yeah. Okay, you could be your own blockage. You are your own blockage. Hmm. Vanity and arrogance are just as powerfully addictive as doubt and fear. Hmm. So be one of all illusions. You're not special. But if you are going into a larger arena in terms of film, as I said, there's an ideological thing that's happening at the moment. My biggest issue is mediocrity. We celebrate mediocrity. And I don't know why we're doing it. I think there might be a reasoning behind it on some levels, but that's just a different political conversation. But the courage to find the truth in an individual idea not individualism in terms of narcissism or egotism, but an individual idea. The courage to interrogate that idea to its core truth is the most difficult thing you will ever do and mm. simultaneously the absolutely most rewarding. That's it. The same, the same problem is the same pleasure. Wow. So let me ask you, Terry, if you've got the chance, before I ask that question, actually, I've got Ray Dolan connecting to us from Mulinga. And it says, good man, Terry, regards. Great to hear the chat about your passion. All right. So that's my really right. in there. <laughs> and so my, what I was going to ask you there was, if you got a chance right now to do a production that wants to bring about a change in our current world with issues that are impacting people's lives, what issue? that you want to, you hopefully want to bring about a change to using a movie that will impact people's lives positively, what will your issue be? It's funny because it's full circle all the way back to that original script that I told you about, the one that I wrote, the prison movie. Hmm. It's called Dogfish, and it's about what men are prepared to do to convince themselves they're men, and what men are prepared to do themselves to themselves and to women to convince themselves that they are not terrified. I think mo most of our core principle problems come from 
a lie and a fallacy that we are force fed and we buy into it convinced that if we dominate within that tiny little cage that we're stuck in that mm. somehow we'll be free that would be the, the same film that I wrote 25 years ago it would be that film and, and it would be difficult yet they it would be difficult yet well it's it's been greenlit a few times and then fell apart and all that kind of stuff but it's that it's that the idea that like you and I have a conversation here now if you and I are not willing to have a conversation about the things that make us uncomfortable then why are we capable of having a conversation about the things that inspire us mm. but more and more we have been compartmentalized into you are this and I am that so you are your color and I am my color you are your gender and I am my gender all this nonsense it's why I love that we're having this conversation. It's why I love that you reached out. It's that thing where you go, what happens when two people who are very, very happily different enjoy the gorgeous celebration of those differences? I love that. Now, that is so powerful, and that is a fantastic way to kind of wrap up. <laughs> that is so powerful. And Terry, maybe, just perhaps we might look at the possibility of addressing those thoughts, right, through a movie. How people can begin to value difference, can begin to see that difference in itself is powerful and that there is a benefit to harnessing the values that each difference brings to the table, you know, and, 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 and having a mutual benefit from that as individuals. For people to explore that and give themselves the chance. The chance. Sometimes we don't even give ourselves that chance. We like don't, but, frankly said, we've been conditioned. Yeah. But again and again, I, I, I don't think that if you think differently from me on a certain subject, that you are now my enemy. I love that you think differently. Mm. But if I'm frightened, and if I'm desperate to fit in with the new moral doctrine, and I want to make sure that I don't raise my head above the parapet, I must condemn you for being mm. different. When did that become our new normal? That's not normal. Mm. I adore our differences. And hopefully everyone begins to see it that way. Terry, you might, we might have to get a script that will help people see difference. Maybe this is a project we should, we should start thinking about embarking on to tell that <laughs> message, to spread that message, you know, to help people see the value of that message. That well, difference is good. I want to go back to Nigeria, so that's the perfect reason to do it. Oh, come on, then we go back to Nigeria. And like I always say, there is no diversity without inclusion. You know, if we're speaking the language of diversity, then there should be inclusivity as well to bring it all home. And that's when we see the value. There are great people everywhere and there are assholes everywhere. Let's focus on, <laughs> let's focus on the great people. <laughs> Well, definitely, Terry, we've got to do something. <laughs> I just want to take one last message here before we wrap up. There's a message from Fab Fabregas, uh, and he says, Terry, I don't know how many people know about you in this life, but I just, I'm just going to be honest with you. Terry, you have inspired me and everyone that is on now. And I think he speaks for everyone who is watching this episode of Sharing with Yemi today. Terry, I'm delighted to have had you on the show. Thank you so much for sharing. You're such a, a breath of fresh air and such a ball of inspiration. And I think you've challenged a number of people here today to look at the possibilities, to look beyond the challenges and even allow themselves to be afraid, allow themselves to make mistakes, allow themselves to fall and learn how to stand properly the next time. You know? to, be, to be vulnerable is beautiful. It's not something to be ashamed of. Hmm. What you should be ashamed of is our ab reaction to being vulnerable. It doesn't hmm. mean you have to be ugly because you're vulnerable. Be vulnerable and be beautiful. Hmm. I'll see you again. It's lovely to talk to you. Same My kid is outside. I gotta run. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you so much. It's been such a delight having Terry on sharing with Yemi today. I'm sure you were blessed. I was. And, you know, just knowing that we all have an opportunity to step into the next realm, our realm, which gives us the chance to experience a newness, to experience a positive, learning how to recognize the people who can bring us there, not turning our backs on them just because they're different, 
but actually recognizing that that difference is what we need, is what we've been waiting for. That difference is what will bring us where we need to go. Thank you, Terry. It's been such an honor having a guru like yourself on the show today. I hope that you've been blessed by my guest today. And I hope that perhaps if you've had something in there wanting to come out, you might take a pen and a paper, like Ivelyn had asked. You might start scribbling something and you might come up with a book that expresses the true you and is sharing a message that the world needs to hear. Remember they say that the grave is the richest place in the world because people die and take with them a message that was never handed down to the world before they left. So don't let that happen. Thank you everyone who's joined in. Richard Fingley, thank you so much. I see you there and everybody else who's been a part of the show today. A fantastic team of mine. I want to say thank you for always making this happen. We're back tomorrow, Wednesday. And until then, then if you're not going anywhere, stay home. Please keep staying safe and do look after each other. God bless you all. My name is Yemi Adinuka, your host and sharing with you. In this part of the world, there's this segregation that comes with persons living with disability. If human interaction is naturally normal and when you don't have it, your mind can play tricks on you. I've come to realize that my only mode of communication is my photography. If I am a victim of abuse, there was nothing I could have done with that person to avoid being a victim except to get away from it. For the first time ever, I think us as grown ups, we don't have the answer. When I committed blood, I said to God, into your hands I commit my spirit and blood. I do the hard, hard work of creating the right atmosphere for any woman who has a story to tell to know that I will fight for her rights to tell it. So join me at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live.